In today's video, I show you how to 3D print your own wireframe shapes using modifiers in Blender. If you just got a 3D printer and want to dive into modeling, or you're looking for tips and tricks to improve your prints, this simple project will turn basic shapes into awesome geometries. Let's get started. Hi guys, I'm Douglas from Hexagizmo. For this tutorial, I will be outlining a basic method for creating stylized wireframe meshes using primitives in Blender. Once we've modeled these shapes, we'll bring them over to Prusa Slicer to talk about 3D printing them. You can use this method to convert some meshes you may already have, or to start from scratch from basic polygons. Please note that this method works best for simple geometry, so your mileage may vary with high poly counts. I really love the 5 platonic solids, and I feel like these are great examples for this project. I've made a set of them here using these steps. Step 1. Get your base mesh. Open up a new project in Blender, and in this case I actually won't destroy the default cube, but in case you have out of force of habit, where your starting environment is empty, press Shift A to add a mesh. You can go with any of these options here, or I like to go into Math function and click Regular Solid. If you don't see those options, they come from an included add-on you have to enable called Extra Objects. To enable it, go to Edit, Preferences, click Add-ons and search for Extra Objects. Click the checkbox and you should now see those prefabs. This menu has many presets of different polyhedra you can choose from and customize. But for now, I'll stick with the cube. Step 2. Modeling with Modifiers Okay, step two is where all the magic happens. This is where we use modifiers to create the geometry automatically at each edge. A modifier is basically a calculation that is done live on top of your mesh. Whenever we change a value within a modifier, it recalculates all the points on the fly. This is called non-destructive editing because you can build on and change aspects of the mesh with live variables that aren't permanent. Click the blue wrench on the sidebar to add a modifier, and we'll add the wireframe modifier to our object. The thickness starts out small, so let's increase it to about 0.5. Now we can start to see the desired effect. If you like the look of the sharp edges, you can pretty much stop here, but I like to introduce some curvature, so next we'll add a bevel modifier. The bevel modifier basically rounds off each edge of the mesh. The final modifier is called Subdivision Surface. This takes each point of the geometry and divides it into more faces, then smooths those faces out. The levels sets the degree of smoothness. I think it's amazing how we can take what was once 12 straight lines and turn it into thousands of really small lines that appear curved. With these modifiers, you can play around with any of the settings within them to change the way your mesh looks. In order for these changes to become permanent, click the arrow on each modifier and hit apply. For most applications, this workflow is good enough, and it works with most shapes you might have. But there are a few challenges with getting this exact geometry to print nicely that I'll get into later. So I have another method to create this type of geometry with the limitations of 3D printing in mind. Step 2b, Destructive Modeling. This method I've found achieves a similar look with slightly different angles, and it can be easier to print. This way is a bit more challenging, but it also gives you more control over the shape. So this time, let's start with a dodecahedron. We'll press tab to go into edit mode, and first we need to select and remove edges in our mesh that we don't want appearing in the wireframe. Press 2 to select edges, double tap A to deselect everything, and hold shift while clicking to select multiple edges at once. Once you've selected all the unneeded edges, press X and hit Dissolve Edges. Next, press 3 to select faces, and press A to select all faces. Then we'll press I to inset faces. You may notice that nothing has happened yet, but it seemed like we manipulated something. If we look in the little menu on the bottom and check Individual, we can now see the effect. Moving the thickness slider here will control the thickness of the inset faces, and thus the size of the wireframe elements. You kind of have to eyeball this, so I'll start out at around 0.25. Maybe I want a bit thinner, so 0.2. Once you've got it to where you want it, roughly, press X to delete faces. 
These changes are permanent on the mesh, so if you want to change them later, you'll have to manipulate those points or start from scratch. Hence the destructive part in destructive editing. From here, we get out of edit mode, and we want to add a solidify modifier. This modifier does a 3D sort of extrusion in or out, based on the direction of its faces. Again, we move the thickness to roughly where we want it to be. Select even thickness so that the inner geometry of the wireframe becomes thicker and more solid. And finally, we can add our bevel and subdivision surface modifiers from the prior method to give it that smooth look. Your mileage may vary with this method, especially because you could easily end up creating a non-manifold mesh or a mesh that is not printable. But the whole point of doing it this way is so that the outer geometry will be flat and uniform, so that it can have a flat bottom to rest on while printing. Stylistically this is different from the other method, but from a printability standpoint it comes out better to make sure it has a nice surface finish on all its faces. Step 3. Export, sizing, and preparation. Finally, we can export our mesh and prepare it for slicing. Hit File, Export, Export STL. The STL file is a standard 3D file type used in most 3D applications. Now with our STL file exported, we'll open up my slicer of choice, Prusa Slicer. First, we'll import our model into the scene. It will ask if the file is saved in millimeters or inches. Normally Blender exports in millimeters, but because our model was so small at that scale, I'll say inches. To correctly orientate our object, select the object and click the Place on Face tool. Then carefully select a white polygon in the center of the face. Once our object is settled, we need to make a small flat cut at the bottom. Click the Cut tool and move the cutter as close to the bottom as you can get it. The goal here is to make sure there's enough surface area for the print to stick to the bed. Uncheck Keep Lower Part and click Perform Cut. The scale of the object is shown on the right sidebar. If we want the printed object to be 3 inches tall, or 76.2 millimeters, we'll type 76.2 into the z-axis field. It helps to have a ruler or digital calipers on hand, as well as a unit conversion calculator, to get a better sense of what real-world measurements will look like in the final product. If your slicer doesn't have these features like cutting and reorienting your part, I recommend trying 3D Builder for Windows 10. You can manipulate your part there before bringing it to the slicer. Now we're ready to move on to slicing. Step 4. Slicing and Limitations of 3D Printing the slicer's job is to take your mesh files and turn them into G-code, which is the language that 3D printers operate in. Prusa Slicer has great profiles for Prusa printers, as well as Ender 3, Creality CR10, and more which are being added by the community. One interesting quirk of the printing process is that strength-wise, 3D prints are always weakest in the Z direction. To compensate for this, we're going to increase the amount of perimeters on each layer to 4. This increases the surface area each layer has to adhere to itself, increasing the strength. For the infill, I usually stick with the grid pattern at 10-15% to fill. One of the most important considerations to make with 3D printing are overhangs. Basically, 3D printers cannot print in midair, and so they can only build off material that is already there. Most printers can only really handle around 45-50 to 50 degrees of overhang before the surface finish suffers in quality. Here's an overhang test from my Prusa Mark III. When we look at a cube made with the default wireframe modifier, this mesh has triangle-shaped cross-sections that are too steep to print, steeper than that critical overhang angle. So in this case, we need to enable support material in our print. I personally kind of despise support material, and I typically want to only create models that don't need supports. But the basic idea is that the slicer will generate vertical pillars of material that support the model's overhanging features. They are intended to be broken off and removed once the print is finished. How close that material gets is the part that's difficult to get right, because you want it to be close enough to support the overhangs, but not too close that it gets stuck to the part. The Z distance and X and Y distance variables are what you need to look at to change that balance. 
Every printer is different, but I would recommend starting at 0.1mm below in the z-axis and 0.1mm away in the xy axes. You may want to be closer or further than that depending on the capabilities of your printer. I would also recommend checking the box for support on build plate only, because this prevents support material from being generated on top of your print. The next most important limitation of 3D printing is called bridging. I know I said before that printers cannot build in midair, but it turns out that they can somewhat. As long as the extruder travels in a straight line and has material on both sides, it can extrude a thin string that is held under tension for the entire gap. Once it touches the other side, it starts to harden and stay in place. In order to get the best quality out of bridges, one thing I've noticed is that you can get slightly better bridges by having them be V-shaped at the bottom. This is a comparison of a flat bridge and a V-shaped bridge. To me, the V-shaped bridge is easier to clean up with either sandpaper or just an X-Acto knife. So this is more of a modeling consideration to make than a slicing one. But what we can easily do in the model is go back and change the bridges. So in this cube, for example, we basically want what would be the lower part of the bridge to be at a different level than the higher part of the bridge. You can do this by scaling the inner rings to be smaller than the outer rings, or vice versa. First we have to apply the solidify modifier. Then press tab to go into edit mode, press 2 to select edges, then hold shift and alt while selecting an edge to select the whole ring. Keep holding shift and alt and select all the outer rings. Then switch the pivot point to individual origins, so you can scale each ring about its own center. Then press S to scale. You can also do this for the inner rings. Now the bridge edges are at different levels. Finally, let's look at a setting called the seam, or the Z seam. Every layer of the print has to start and stop somewhere. That point is called the seam, and it generally looks bad on the surface. In Prusa Slicer, we want to set the seam to a position where it's less noticeable on the print. When you set the seams to nearest, it makes it so that each seam is nearest to each other seam. They're less noticeable here on this corner than they would be on the face of the print. Finally, let's slice our model and print this thing. I hope this video has given you new knowledge about Blender and 3D printing. I really enjoyed doing this project and I hope you enjoyed it too. Please let me know what you thought of the video in the comments below. For more information on how I capture these special rotating time lapses, hit subscribe for when I make another video on the topic. And if you're interested in buying a 3D print of these wireframe shapes, check out my Etsy shop, hexagizmo.com, where I offer my unique 3D printed geometry as well as a custom printing service where I 3D print your models. Thanks for watching and happy printing!